Okay, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever and whenever you are. Thanks for making today's webinar part of your day. I'm Jeff Rasmussen, host of the Legacy Family Tree webinar series. And if you can believe it, this is now our 33rd webinar we've presented in this past year. And it's going to be a great one. We have genealogybank.com's Tom Kemp with us today to teach us about the role that newspapers can play in our genealogy research. But before we get started today, today's webinar is brought to you by the makers of Legacy Family Tree. And if you're new here, you can download your free copy of Legacy from our website or upgrade to the Deluxe Edition, which has lots of other bells and whistles. And if you're new to genealogy, it will also help you get started in gathering what you know, help you find new ancestors, and when you're ready for it, it will help you share your tree in lots of fun ways. And I've got an image here on the screen of one of the greatest features in the Deluxe Edition, uh, the Research Guidance Tool. What it does is it looks at what you already know about your ancestor and creates a checklist of places to search. So in the case of my ancestor, Christian Rasmussen, because he was born in Denmark, it suggests that I first look at the 1845 Denmark Census. And all I have to do is click on its online button, and I'm taken directly to the website with these records. So because I know he lived in the state of Idaho, it also provides links to search the online Idaho marriage collections. So when you're stuck and need a little bit of guidance, uh, check out Legacy's research guidance. Now as a reminder, uh, all of our upcoming webinars are found on our webinars page at, at LegacyFamilyTree.com slash webinars dot ASP. Uh, we publish our announcements on our blog and uh, here's the address for that if you don't have that bookmarked yet. And we've also just this morning updated our webinar brochure with our upcoming webinars. So you can print that off and share it with your genealogy society or local family history center. You can also follow us on Facebook by clicking the recommend button here. And one other way to keep up with our webinars is by adding our webinar calendar to your Google Calendar. Now, finally, I'm told that we're looking for a single female to share a cabin with another single female in our group for our uh, eighth annual Legacy Genealogy Cruise this September. Uh, just over a month from now, we will depart for that. Next year's cruise in 2012 will visit Norway, England, Ireland, France, Scotland, and Denmark. So you can visit our website for more details about that. So our main event today is Tom Kemp's Newspapers for Genealogists, Using Genealogy Bank to Document Every Day of Your Ancestors' Lives. And stick around afterwards when we'll give away some great door prizes, including two free subscriptions to genealogybank.com. So that's exciting. We'll also give away our traditional discount coupon for our live viewers, announce our next live webinars, and then we'll head into our Q&A session with Tom. Feel free to use your webinar's control panel. It's in the upper right of your screen uh, to type your questions. And we'll try to get to as many of those uh, as we can. But before we introduce Tom, he would like to know just a little bit more about you. So our first poll question of the day is, what level of genealogist are you? Beginner, intermediate, advanced, or expert? So just click on the answer that best describes uh, where you think that you're at in your genealogy career. And I'll share the results with you here in, in just a few more seconds. OK. So here's the result. 61% uh, of you are, are right in the middle there, 28% uh, advanced, 11% beginner, and 1% uh, expert. Very good. So let me, uh, let's me let hide that. I'm going to uh, share with you our second poll. Uh, because Tom is going to use genealogybank.com to teach us today, he would like to know, are there any of you out there that are currently a member of genealogybank.com? And uh, just a simple yes or no for this poll question. OK. And I'll share the results. So just over half uh, are currently not. And uh, we've got a good member, a number of you here today that are uh, current members of genealogybank.com. Excellent. OK, just want to make sure that you're back to seeing 
seeing my screen here before we proceed. I always want to take care of a couple of these technical things, get them out of the way. Uh, you should. Uh, I, I just. I just want to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page here. Uh, you should be seeing the screen with with uh, Tom Kemp's picture now. Uh, just a few of you could. Could you either answer yes or no before we uh, continue there in your chat area? Okay, thanks. I've got enough answers now. It uh, seems to be working just fine. Well, let's introduce Tom. Uh, Thomas J. Kemp is director of genealogy products at NewsBank. A well-known genealogist, librarian, and speaker for over 30 years. He is the author of more than 30 books. And, uh, you know, if you know Tom, you know that he is energetic and passionate about genealogy. I've known him to excel at whatever he does. I had the privilege of serving with Tom uh, on the board of directors of the Utah Genealogical Association. Now, this was several years ago now. I was impressed. He always thought outside of the box to try to bring new ideas on how we could pr promote our society and genealogy in general. And uh, one of the very first books I added to my personal genealogy library was his International Vital Records Handbook. Well, Tom spoke uh, spoke to us last back in February, and we're very pleased to have him back. And he comes today uh, to us today from the beautiful state of Connecticut. So, uh, hi, Tom, and welcome back. Hello, thank you. Uh, it's uh, so good to have you back, and uh, I consider you a, a good friend and somebody I really look up to, and uh, we're all anxious to hear from you and what you have to say. So to get us started, Tom, I'm going to switch the controls over to you, and in just a second you should have that on your screen, and, uh, and that worked out really well. So everyone should be seeing uh, Tom's uh, screen now, and... Uh, Tom, the rest of the time is all yours. Thanks again. Excellent. Thank you. Looking forward to this. We're going to walk you through newspapers. I like to say that it's a great day for genealogy. It's an incredible day for genealogy. Genealogy is just pouring out of the computer with all of the resources that are going online. And uh, there was an interesting statistic that Pretty much half of you are already members of Genealogy Bank. You'll be very pleased to know that Genealogy Bank is going over one billion articles this month. Uh, so there'll be more than a billion records in Genealogy Bank. You know, when we launched five years ago, it had 160 million items. And now to be over one billion, I, I think, is just staggering uh, to contemplate. But we're going to talk today about the value of the newspapers in particular, what you're going to find there, and how you're going to document the lives of your ancestors uh, pretty much every day of their lives. And what we're going to tell you is specific to Genealogy Bank, but of course applies to newspapers wherever you find them. Genealogy Bank has over 5,500 newspapers. It will go over 6,000 this month, and as soon as we get an accurate count, we'll let you know. It covers all 50 states. It does date back to 1690, right up to the present. As I mentioned, over a billion records. There are also in the various sections and categories that uh, Genealogy Bank is divided into, there are over 263,000 rare books and documents. All of this boils down to over 200 million obituaries. So it's quite staggering. It's very likely that you're going to find your people. And so let me walk you through it. As you have questions, please shoot them to Jeff. We'll either insert them during the conversation right now or at the end as best suits the pace of, of our gathering here. But uh, as we look at these newspapers, they come in all shapes and sizes. The overwhelming bulk of them are what we would call a small town newspaper. So it's a great uh, diversity, a great cross section of America, and you can expect to find newspapers that cover your area. Of course, there are a lot of larger cities represented as well. So here we go, key items. Probably the most popular item that people look for are obituaries. I like to point out that they do date back to the earliest times. This uh, first example from the Boston Newsletter back in 1704 is the obituary of Captain Peregrine White. And uh, you get so you'll have to learn how to read an obituary and to see it 
uh, for what it was. Notice the typefaces that were used back in the early days. So this is Marshfield, M-A-R-S, and uh, that may not be as apparent. That was just the old way of uh, writing the letter uh, S. And uh, so uh, Marshfield, Captain Peregrine White of this town, so that would be Marshfield, aged 83 years and eight months. Nice touch like, that you can start to computer back the age. But you'll see that he was uh, born on board the Mayflower and uh, when it docked back in 1620. So uh, this is quite remarkable. And it does show that newspapers cover the entire span of U.S. history. So it's a tremendous resource. We wish that every copy of every newspaper survived. They didn't. But Genealogy Bank is working diligently uh, to find every missing copy, which is why the huge increase in uh, data this month. They've gone back and added a lot of missing issues. And again, that was over 155, 160 million uh, items being added this month alone. And I think you heard me say that when we launched, we had 160 million articles and records in Genealogy Bank. So to add that much in one month, to me, is staggering. But the easy shorthand is it's over a billion articles now. Uh, obituaries can be very pivotal and they can fill in a lot of details, missing facts that you're just not finding in other records. So you do need to comb them for every date uh, where, your where your ancestors lived in a given community. This is one for a, a youngster, two-year-old, and in this case, again, uh, they like to give the details two years, four months, 20 days, so it makes it easy for you to compute back when she was actually born. So we have Levina Ayers, born in 1846, died in 1848. And if you think of that, that is in between the census years. So if we look back into Greenberg, uh, Westchester County, New York, we do find them in the 7, 1850 census. And of course, quite quickly, we see that there was a gap uh, in the age of the children. And it's a the primary indicator to us, we have an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, and then it jumps to a one-year-old. Probably a good indicator that there may have been a child that was lost. And of course, we know that that was Levina. And uh, it's just a stunning, stunning thing to have this. And as you find these documents for your family and realize that there are people that you are looking for that you did not necessarily know, existed. You found them in the census records, you found them in other records, but there's not too many records that are going to mention a two-year-old that has passed away. And so here was an opportunity to pull in the names of the family members for the off-census years. And in this case you get the added benefit of seeing a poem that the family used to memorialize the child at the time. Very gripping, very detailed, very, very emotional and uh, a real treasured item. This is the kind of detail that you're looking for as you go through the newspapers. Now when you search in, in Genealogy Bank, a quick tip as you get into it, you do want to keep it simple. You're crossing 300 years of newspapers. They're going to use the different type fonts as we suggested with Peregrine White. Uh, they're going to have tough uh, copies of the newspapers because these were printed on, uh, in effect, homemade paper sometimes. It's not that bad, but they were, they were uh, manufactured at, at earlier times in the history of the country when the, it perhaps wasn't as uh, well done as it might have been at, at other periods. And of course, newspapers since 1876 is even worse. But uh, so you have to allow for that, and you have to be flexible as you're searching. I like to suggest to people that you begin your search by searching only on the surname. And uh, that way you can, you can see just what is the scope. If you have a common name like Smith, well, you're just going to get too many hits. But there still are ways to limit those and to try and help you fine tune it. But when you have other names like Ayers that don't come up as often, you're able to cut through it and to zero in on, the t on your target articles. 
so one thing you can do, you can search all of Genealogy Bank from the top half of the screen, or you can go to the bottom half of the screen and click to go through to just the specific historical newspapers or the books or the documents, the more recent newspaper obituaries, in this case, the historical. And uh, by typing in a name like Smith and doing a search on the historical newspapers, we know we're going to get a lot of hits, uh, and we do. Uh, but as you get a hit, in this case, a search done on the name Starbird, notice that on the side panel, you can narrow that search down to fewer hits. You can zero in on just the 55 obituaries, just the 49 marriage notices. So it is possible to cut these things down from the 2,600 hits for the surname to just the 55 obits that you're really looking for. You can also dip into the modern, more recent obituaries where we've pulled out the obituaries for the last 30, 40 years and zero down those because so many people are looking only for a recent obituary. And this, and they're not necessarily using Genealogy Bank for genealogy research. So this allows them to zero in. Notice that you can also uh, click through to a specific state. That will bring you to the city. You can then zero in and search a specific newspaper or groups of newspapers. So we make it flexible for you on both sides, the older digital newspapers or the current, uh, just the obituaries. Now, if we were searching in this example for Grace Toms, her maiden name Stewart, I was searching for her in both sides. Could I find her in the obituaries in the older newspapers or in the modern ones? She was born about 1896 in Stanford, Connecticut. Her spouse's name was Charles. And, uh, and she basically, all the family members lived in Stanford. A general search in Genealogy Bank produces 3,500 hits. Too many to search, so I narrowed it down to just the more recent obituaries to see if that was including her. I got 176 hits, uh, 167. And then limiting it to just Connecticut obituaries, I got none. So we tried it over again uh, by looking for her husband. That got us 700 hits in Connecticut, just one obituary, but it was not him. Now, that was in the modern obituaries. So trying again with the modern obituaries for her, but in this point, I added, notice that you can add uh, include other keywords in your search. So by putting in her name here and adding an extra word here, in this case I'm going to add the word Stanford because typically an obituary will say she was born in Stanford or some such reference. So just to see if that would narrow the field of hits, that was the approach I took. And so I added the extra word Stanford, came up with just one obituary, and that allowed me to zero in on her. And it turns out at this point she was living uh, down in the Maryland area, and her obituary appeared in the Washington Post. So it was not what I, what I expected. I anticipated she would be in the Northeast, be in Connecticut. I was limiting to that, finding nothing. But you don't want to give up at that point. You want to try different options and see how you could uh, perhaps uh, find her somewhere else in the country. So we find out at this point how old she was, where she died. She was a native of Stanford. Tells us that her husband died in 1920. So that's not why we were not finding him in the more recent obituaries. And so we could turn back in and, and look for that. But we found that she indeed died in 1992. So in addition to the obituaries, which everyone really gravitates toward, I want to just walk you through the types of sources that are available. And one of the key ones, uh, as we start out, our births. They love to announce the birth of a child. That was news. It was news early on and it's news today. Notice uh, the variety of announcements here. This one, for example, is actually a paid classified ad. So newspapers take it in different approaches, but giving you examples. Here's one from the Aberdeen Herald, fairly recent in 1999, and it just announced that a daughter uh, you know, Bailey Lane Volek was born in such and such a date, who the parents were, and as we go through this, 
we see it gives the child's name and date, place of birth, the mother's maiden name, the names of both sets of grandparents, and the names of the great-grandparents. Now, don't we wish that every single birth announcement in the paper uh, was this detailed? It would just make our lives so much easier. They aren't all like that, but that's the type of thing you should look for. Very, very common, especially as you get into the small town paper where they knew everyone. And so you say, gee, that surname sounds familiar. Are they related to the so-and-sos, the so-and-sos? And by adding this extra layer of data, the readers would instantly connect the dots and say, oh, yes, I knew their grandparents, or oh, yes, I know that family. They're on the farm just over the ridge or something like that. So this was the kind of detail you could expect, excellent content, and it's what you'll find in the newspapers in Genealogy Bank and other sites. Other typical obituaries like these, and excuse me, birth announcements like these, notice that they cover a wider area. Here you have the Fort Wayne Sentinel. 1917, but they have information from neighboring states, Payne, as in Payne, Ohio, Woodburn, Indiana, Butler, Indiana, and it has the information on these family members. Now, notice in the second case, this is their third daughter. Uh, in the last example, it talks about the father having left to go work uh, at an army base. He was drafted, and he was called away. So it gives you some details there, tells you the maiden name of the mother, that she was teaching, uh, a teacher in the Butler City Schools. So a lot of good information there that you can use. You're not looking at these birth marriage obituary announcements just for the facts of the birth marriage death, but also for the collateral information that you can get, the additional information you'll get about the family. This is why you also want to search for obituaries and birth announcements, etc for every member of the family. If I were working on a surname and say, uh, for example, this uh, Cairns in the middle line, that's, that to me is a more distinctive surname, more unusual, I would gather every single one of them. And you'll want to map out that family as a household, mom, dad, and the kids, and start to make a road map as to who's where and how they all fit together. There might be clues in one that will be the answer that you're looking for on another part of the family later. So uh, snag them all, document them, tag and bag them, and, and hang on to them. You'll need them. In addition to flat-out birth announcements, they sometimes come under a heading uh, more distinctive, usually whatever is the established practice of a newspaper, but they might call it a cradle roll. We very often see that in terms of church registers, where a church will announce a cradle roll, meaning the newborns of the members of the congregation, and that will be put in the newspaper, that will be put in church publications, and uh, so it's a common phrase that's used. And the listing can be a little bit briefer. In this case, you see it's quite a few listings, not as much detail on each child in the format of this newspaper, but it's another format that you wanted to track down in addition to just a birth announcement as such. Another common thing that you'll see in newspapers is to, to celebrate the anniversary, the birth dates of the children. Typically, it's done on the first anniversary, uh, the first, first birthday, but you'll see in this article from 1964, this is uh, in the first example of a four-year-old daughter, and here you have obviously children of two different ages, and then this last little fellow uh, is a one-year-old. So it can vary, and in this case, they include the photographs. This can be terrific. It may be the only photograph you're going to find of a child um, that's passed down in the family. Things might get lost, fire, flood, and the like. So you want to look for these not just as birth announcements, but also birth date uh, celebrations along the way. As I mentioned earlier, you get the articles that for some newspapers, they don't carry birth announcements. They don't carry those anniversary type. They make the, the subscribers, the readers in those areas, take out an actual paid classified ad. But people will do that. Uh, it's very enthusiastic. It becomes the local custom, and they run with it. And so here you have uh, one from the Dallas Morning News where they're announcing the birth of the child and uh, with a lot of good humor. He's finally here. 
uh, people do that too for celebrating the birthday of someone later in life. They turn 40, they turn 50. Uh, they'll take out ads uh, for an anniversary of a couple. But so here you see a paid advertisement that appeared for this woman, uh, a Linda Van Note. And, and they have a lot of fun with that too, throwing in the names of other celebrities or Mrs. Potato Head and things like that. So it's sort of a little happy birthday fun, upbeat announcement, but you want to look for those and uh, that will be distinctive and separate. So if you're just concentrating on when the person was born, you might miss these articles that appeared one year, two years, three years, or 40 years after the fact. So be flexible as you approach it and you're going to want to look for the person. Again, you're going to want to search by surname and you're going to want to narrow it down so that you won't miss any of these articles. Again, giving you the entry point there, showing how you can just, just put in the surname and click search. The historical newspapers, again, as I walked you through in the obituary example, but the same for the uh, searching for births. And when you get them, in this case, the Smith examples are a huge number, uh, literally millions, but you can limit it by just the birth announcements, which ratchets it way down to 2,800. And then you're going to want to limit by, uh, by place and, uh, and break them into smaller chunks so that you can sift through them. Again, if you have a distinctive surname that you know by experience is not commonly distributed throughout the community, but that typically people of that surname are related, especially ones from a certain town or county, you'll want to gather all of them so that you can fit them together later. So we move from birth announcements and birthday type announcements, we get marriage announcements. And they come in all shapes and sizes too. You can expect to find them from engagement announcements where the families, typically the parents, are announcing the engagement of a child. But uh, notice that in this case, in the sep second example here, we have uh, Miss Marie Attlee of Wayne, Pennsylvania, announcing the engagement of her niece. And uh, so that could be a definite clue to you that something has happened in the family, the parents are out, out of the picture, perhaps, perhaps they're, they've died, uh, perhaps there's an estrangement, don't know. But typically, these things are clues that would tell us what's happening in the family. But it gives us the names of the principals involved, the names of the locations where the event is perhaps going to occur, where they're living, and so it can give us the details that we're looking for. We're looking for the clues of the names of the bride and groom, location of the church, potential date of the wedding, where the couple will live, names of the parents, any biographical information about the bride and groom, uh, names of members of the wedding party, and of course pictures of the bride and groom. The, uh, be sure to go through all of that information. I had a marriage announcement and marriage clipping that I had for years on a, a mine of the family that I was never able to extend back. And all of a sudden one day I was rereading that marriage announcement. I went down the list of relatives and spotted a relative that I had never heard of before. So it gave me a brand new person to target and to investigate further. So you'll want to make sure you investigate every clue in these newspaper clippings. Now, for example, here is uh, marriage announcements that were published in Brattleboro, Vermont, back in 1834. And right away, you notice uh, several things. Uh, Hinsdale is in New Hampshire. The newspaper is in Vermont, but you're getting a uh, New Hampshire marriage. You're getting a marriage from Shutesbury, which is in Massachusetts. You're getting a marriage from Albany, uh, which is in New York. Now, there is an Albany, Vermont, but in this case, this is a New York uh, marriage. And so be aware right away that it isn't necessarily the newspaper published in your hometown that you're looking for. It's one that covered that sphere of influence, so to speak. How far ranging? was the editor and the publisher of that newspaper that they tried to include content that would appeal to people beyond uh, where they lived. Notice too, 
uh, clues within in the article. In this case, Deacon Oliver Dutton of Ludlow, age 73, to Miss Phoebe Power of Shutesbury, age 70, on the day of marriage. So that's a per pretty clear clue to me that that's probably was her birth date. And, uh, and then you subtract 70 years and we'll probably come up with her date of birth. Certainly a good clue worth investigating to verify if that was the case. And it gives us a nice date of birth well back into the 1700s. So clues that we would not be able to get in any other way. As we uh, uh, look at this next example in the Eastern Argus from 1828, we... Uh, we see that on, in this town on Thursday evening last, the Reverend uh, Rand was performing, and so this marriage, etc. So Thursday evening last, we'll want to go quickly to a perpetual calendar, and since the paper was published on the 19th, then you'll see that the last Thursday was the 14th. You get your date, and then you can verify the information uh, in this marriage announcement. So again, Mine it for every clue. Make sure you see what the clues represented. You see how it changed from line to line in this marriage announcement. In Falmouth, uh, Falmouth by such and such a minister, the so-and-so people, and then it says of Gray. Well, you need to be familiar with the local towns, and in this case, Gray, Maine. And then in the next wedding, in Gray, Gray, Maine, by the same would be the Reverend C. Cummings, uh, Robert Starbird, and Miss Ag Abigail Haskell. Now, this was a wow moment for me because those were my second great grandparents. I was truly shocked to find that they had their wedding announcement in the paper. And this brought me to another conclusion that I, uh, it, it just broke what I had accepted as a given. My given was my people, my obscure people absolutely would not be in newspapers. We, I come from a long line of nobodies. I saw no reason why they would appear in the newspaper short of an obituary or some such. And this just showed me how wrong I was. The newspapers were written to appeal to the local population, the local readership, and they would be interested in their neighbors. In this case, a Portland, Maine newspaper, the Eastern Argus, was publishing marriage announcements from all over the state of Maine, Deer Isle, China, Sydney, Wyndham, etc., because they wanted a wide readership and they would get obscure people uh, like Robert Starbird and his wife Abigail Haskell. So I was thrilled. To me, it was a wow moment. I was going to dig in newspapers no matter what. And that's the approach I want you to take with this. Keep digging, you will find your people. Another uh, item that you'll pull from a marriage record and find it a value. It's, it's going to give you details like this. In this case, in this marriage, they're telling you that this woman was the second daughter uh, in the Middleton household, or that this Annie uh, was the youngest daughter of the late Colonel Kenderton Smith. So you're getting a lot of clues, a lot of details about the family in a marriage record that you wouldn't have uh, expected to get. Again, another reason why you want to keep digging in newspapers. In this example, for Amos Broadwater, he, uh, he lived and died in Garrett County, Maryland. This is him and his wife uh, in the 1880s census. They're in their 70s at this point. And as you can see, he's going to die here in the early 1900s. But he is listed in the 1900 census. And in the 1880, he's there with his wife, Sarah, but by the 1900 census, he's listed as a widower uh, with a W in the census and aged yet that much further. But thanks to the newspaper, we get another fact about the family that he had remarried at the age of 91. Now, in this census, we had him at age 95, so this was several years later. And single, as a widower, we would assume that he was a widower based on having been married to Sarah, but it, as we dig further, we find that his wife, uh, that he had remarried, and there was another wife, and I'll flip over here to make it easier to see, age 91, new spouse, Eliza Warwick, age 55, that they lived in those two counties, 
They were married in Frostburg recently. His first wife of 63 years, Sarah, had died 14 months ago. It was the only death in the family for a while. He had 12 children, 99 grandchildren, etc. lists all these details and told us that he was hale and hearty and the oldest man in Garrett County, quite well to do. Uh, so a lot of information can be generated by a marriage record and we can fill in details again that might be missing from the other sources that we've relied upon uh, to build our family trees. Another phase of marriage records, so you have engagements, marriages themselves, they celebrate the anniversaries of couples. In this case, a couple uh, had been married 75 years. Just a terrific accomplishment. They were in their uh, 90s. This appeared in 1948 in the Dallas Morning News. And uh, there's also difficulties that arise in marriage. Not every marriage succeeds, and there were divorces. And as we see here from this variety, those happened very early on. So they might be articles that appeared in the older newspapers, onesies, twosies, but as we get into modern times, here's a list of 77 or 78 divorces uh, that were granted. So uh, these are records that can help us document the family, what became of them, as the names change, why, and this sort of thing. Notice that uh, they do date from a very early period. Divorce was common in the 18th and 19th century as it is today, though it's not as much talked about perhaps in that, uh, as it would be today. Um, a lot of times these will appear in the newspapers as an actual court record, what we might consider a legal brief, uh, which are just these short notices that appear in the paper for legal reasons that they get posted so the creditors and other people will know the circumstances. And this is one that appeared in 1862, and it gives the details of the family. Uh, I wanted to point out also, there are many, many ethnic or special uh, focus newspapers, in this case Jewish newspapers. Notice that when they publish the details of a wedding or a birth or a death, they will add some of the cultural details that may not be found in a mainstream uh, newspaper because these would be of more interest to the readers of say in this case the New Jersey Chronicle, the Jewish Chronicle of New Jersey. There are Irish newspapers which are going to give details, for example where a person was from in Ireland and give the details. They're more likely to have spelled it correctly as some of these cities can be difficult to spell and so these would be things of greater interest to the Irish American community reading in that newspaper. Or foreign language newspapers, Spanish, German, and the like, again, they're more likely to get the details correct uh, in Spanish or in German with more attention paid to the cultural uh, nuances, the places where they were born, how to spell the names, adding the correct punctuation, and this sort of thing that will just be very useful to you. And I just wanted to point out we have the largest collection of African American newspapers in the United States as well. So we've covered births, marriages, deaths, obituaries. Moving through what you can expect to find in a newspaper that would be of very high interest to a genealogist, family reunions. These come in all sizes and shapes and they were memorialized in the newspaper. This was big news that a family came back to their town to celebrate their heritage. These were their friends and neighbors and they were celebrating their accomplishments. They would almost always have pictures. They would always have details about the family, recipes and the like. But in addition to actually having, well let me give you one more example of a family reunion. Here's one about uh, the um, Garver family. They're from Switzerland and notice the details and the level of detail they tell you that the family is a descendant of Jacob Garver of Switzerland, that the American line of progenitors comes from Christian Garver, who came over in 1790, uh, settled in Dauphin County, one of the descendants celebrated in Dauphin County uh, uh, and came to Decatur, Illinois in 1840, and then it lists the other family members, etc. Great stuff. 
And so it might be details you wouldn't be able to find elsewhere. Sometimes the family reunion type notice are people looking for information so they can reunite the family. And it was common as people went off, today when you move, we can pretty much keep in touch. Facebook, letters, telephones, cell phones are easy, uh, email, but it was much tougher, uh, say in the 1870s, 1840s. Here you have a James Marston of Hampton, New Hampshire. He left home about 25 years ago, which would have been 1853. He now would have been 50 or 60. To their knowledge, he had sailed on the following ships. He had sailed out of New Bedford, Mass. Uh, name of one of his uh, bosses on the ship, so to speak. And here was two individuals that wanted to hear back about him. The Reverend so-and-so and Mrs. Uh, J.C. Hardy of Haverhill, Mass. And so you wonder, I understand a minister, he's probably doing this on behalf of the family. Perhaps there's bad news to share, mom, dad, or something. Uh, someone close in the family has passed away or some such news. You then start to say, well, who's Mrs. J.C. Hardy? Is that the mother who's remarried? Is that a sister? And this is her married name. Great clues for the genealogist. But here is a snapshot of the life of James Marston. And it tells us a little bit about what he's doing. Notice also the newspaper that it appeared in. This is The Friend, published out of Hawaii. This was a newspaper aimed, it was also a specialty newspaper, if you will, aimed at a specific community, in this case, sailors. And uh, with so many ships passing through the Pacific, they all would dock in Honolulu at some point. They would get this newspaper that would keep them in touch. And this was a good way for the family, in this case back in New Hampshire, the logical place for them to send a message and get it to their, to their son, their nephew, their uncle, their, whatever the relationship might be to him, so they could communicate with him and have uh, that family reunion by, by mail, by correspondence, if not able to have it in person. Uh, similar type news, uh, here's another example that also appeared in The Friend. In this case, this one was really interesting. He was looking for information about his family. So this is the sailor looking to find the information. He said, I was born in Albany. I've lost contact with the family for 30 years, about 1841. And here's some terrific family data. Here's my father's name. He ran a grocery store. He was a naturalized Frenchman. He was the longtime sexton at the church. My mother was such and such. She was Scotch-Irish by birth, uh, but a native of South Nova Scotia. I'm not sure how to balance both of those, but you can see what he was trying to say. There were eight children in the family. One was a cabinet maker. Two of my siblings were deaf. Uh, so and it says I'm dumb, but I'm going to assume that's the stock phrase to mean basically deaf. And uh, so these are great clues. Frances, the sister, was actually at a school for the deaf where she was sent to, to get training and to, uh, to, to move ahead with her life. So terrific clues. Don't you wish as a genealogist you were seeing this when it was published back in 1879 so you could help him find and locate his family? Uh, just a terrific piece. You also have, in, again, typically in these specialty newspapers, this in I, the Irish world out of New York, where families would publish notices saying, I'm looking for other members of my family. If anybody's heard from them, let me hear uh, back from you. Notice that this is a New York City newspaper, but it is of interest to Irish Americans all over the country. So even though uh, it's New York City based, this this one is an ad about a family that moved from Ireland to Canada, according to the text here, still lived in Canada, and the writer was actually living in Oregon. You'll see in the other examples as well as we go through them in more detail. The first one, Patrick Riley, here's the specific town in Ireland. That can be almost next to impossible to find. So to find that in a newspaper is pure gold. Last heard from about five years ago, 1899. Worked on a streetcar in New York. Mom's maiden names, sisters, brothers. Oh, and by the way, the brother lived in Butte, Montana.
and he's the one that placed the ad in a New York City newspaper trying to see if he could track down information on his brother. Here's one uh, that he was Irish American, but he left New York City in May of 1873, hasn't been heard from since, thought to have gone to Texas. Here's his description. Uh, and Mrs. Nagy, his sister, now Mrs. M. Coonan, uh, who's also living in New York City, wants to hear from him. So great connections. You can find the uh, married name of a sister, this sort of thing. And again, this example of a person who had left Ireland. Uh, let's, let's see, they were Irish, but living in Canada, up in Lanark County, where a lot of Irish Canadians lived. And she would now, as of 1904, she'd be about 46, gave her description, and how a, another uh, family member wants to hear from them, and that person is living in Oregon. So a terrific way to see the family and as they migrated. Other items you can find in the newspaper that are of regular interest that span over the years. In the early history of our country, indentured servants were quite the norm. And this was how you got your trade. You didn't go to a tech school. You didn't go to high school. You apprenticed yourself to um, a local uh, craftsman of some type. And you promised to work for so many uh, years and uh, learn your trade. And then you could go off and become uh, that. So here you have uh, a runaway, uh, Louis Perra, uh, 20 years of age. And Richard Stillman is obviously very grumpy that, uh, that this kid has run away because he's paid for all his training and yet he's, he's uh, skipped out. Uh, but he offered a whopping three cent reward, which may or may not represent a lot of money in those days, but I thought that was intriguing. You get other ads that are uh, the same nature but a lot grimmer. And these are the familiar runaway slave ads that we've always heard about. And what is very fascinating here, as you see these appear in the paper, the slaves had names. They have deep descriptions. It often talked about family members that they ran away with. And you could see that the value ascribed to the slave, anywhere from $10, 20 to $100, uh, varied over the years. It does give dates. So we're in a very early time period, the 1820s. And this can be invaluable. Uh, in researching early African American history. In addition to occupational type records like that, people were in the military and with serving in the military comes, comes the grim nature of people who passed away. And these would regularly be published in newspapers around the country, as in this example of a list of deaths that occurred in various camps. And you can expect to find in these cases, name and rank, name of the camp, the ages, information about other family members that served in the military that typically would be a tie-in to the article. The father was also in the military kind of thing. What the illness may or may not have been, the names and localities of the kin, name of the funeral home. Now, in this case, these were all deaths that occurred uh, not, not during a war. So this was not a casualty in war. This was simply the deaths that had occurred in military camps, perhaps from outbreaks of the flu or other illnesses, and uh, each case is its own story. So we're, we're looking for deaths of people who died in the military even outside of the wars. But uh, well, also the obituaries would very typically include the fact that a person served, just as you would see today in an obituary that so-and-so had served in World War II or the Korean War. We also get these articles. Now, by 1840, one common theme that you would see in obituaries was the passing of the Revolutionary War soldiers, that that generation was now completely passing away. And so here the header on this, the headline on this, was another revolutionary officer uh, gone. And it talks about this person who joined, served as a private, worked his way up through the uh, war, was actually named a captain, and received a pension as a Revolutionary War officer uh, by the end of his tour of service. So these can be invaluable to document the service of our ancestors, but also to see how they were revered and respected in the community. And this was uh, published in Massachusetts in 1840. 
similar to that are articles about people who received pensions. In this case, they said perhaps the last Revolutionary War pension that would ever be filed at the pension office was just uh, approved in 1887. Now we think of uh, people, we get the question all the time, can I find the pension records of my ancestor, da, da. I know he had a pension, but we don't anticipate somebody who served in the Revolutionary War back in the 1700s getting a pension in 1887, but it does happen. And in this case, it was the widow, uh, Miss Mary Casey uh, of Fayette County, Ohio. Her husband was John Casey, who served in the Revolutionary War in the Virginia line, died in 1845. But a few years prior to his death, he married Mary Cox, and then a girl of 16. And so all of this uh, was in this little uh, article about the last Revolutionary War pension. You know, the same thing happened with the Civil War, and the last pensions for the Civil War were signed by President Eisenhower the night before he left office. Why the night before he left office and turned over the presidency to John Kennedy? Because it was that controversial, he was granting pensions to Confederate survivors, and in that case, a handful of widows, so they were quite elderly. Uh, Confederate widows, but it was that controversial a hundred years later to give them a pension uh, for service in the Civil War. But uh, the states gave pensions, but this was a federal pension. It was the last, one of the last acts that Eisenhower did. Well, with that, you have just, just like um, marriages and gender engagement records, they might engender divorce records, etc., in the newspaper military also gets your draft lists. And it was common, it actually was the front page news. Here was 1917, the draft list being published in Perry, Oklahoma. It was a front page story in the public, Perry Republican of July of 1917 and listed every single person, uh, their number and how they fit in because that would tell the order in which they were called uh, to serve. But with draft lists, there also comes what they call slacker lists. And this was one of 1921 where they went back through, uh, you know, they were tough customers in those days, and they figured out who it was who had registered for the draft and who we had from the 1920 census who didn't register. But now we have names, and we're taking names and making a list, and they published those lists, and the Department of War, the War Department at the time, uh, started circulating those widely for everybody to know and sort of you know, give them a heavy dose of public shame and guilt uh, for having not registered uh, for the draft the first go around. And uh, so here was a list that was published in the Trenton Evening Times, Trenton, New Jersey, and uh, listed those people. The awful thing was you'd get out there with a heavy dose of shame and guilt for having done this, and your mom, your grandma, and your neighbors would all see these and pick on you. These lists were wrong and they, they were riddled with errors and somebody may have actually filed, people had died. So it's always a problem when you're you know, posting these lists of shame and guilt uh, like this. But for the genealogists, they're terrific because they're just clues as to where people lived. You will have to go and verify the accuracy of did he or did he not serve in the draft and et cetera that goes with it. So it's another mini census that serves to point us in the right direction. But these widely appeared in the papers. This was a big deal uh, back in the 1920s. In addition to the celebrations that people have for birth dates, and they're celebrating 40 anniversaries, uh, marriages that lasted 75 years and the like, military reunions, just like high school reunions, college reunions, they were also typical. And you will find articles in the paper about the different companies, the different units, and how they celebrated and looked back and memorialized their, their experience. And in those articles, it's quite common, you can peek over the shoulder of this one article here and see it's quite common to include the names of the people who were attending. And so you can search on your ancestor, find out that they were there. You had no idea, perhaps, what unit they were in, or you know they served in World War I, Spanish American War, whatever, but you didn't know the details. This lets you get in a little bit deeper and share the experience. 
typically these articles will talk about the highlights of the unit, the things they memorialize, that they love to tell the stories around the campfire, literally. Uh, we referred to this one earlier. They also had articles that were published about the military. For example, the leaving of uh, the last letters they had written home. This turns out to be the last letter written by Co Corporal Osborne of South Dakota. Uh, he uh, wrote back basically thanking a neighbor from a neighboring town for having uh, Mrs. Gleason, it said, and he was so impressed by her act of Christian Christmas kindness and what she had done was send him a box of goodies even though she had never uh, met him. She was from a neighboring town in South Dakota and he was just mighty impressed that she had done this and he wrote this letter thanking her and then the following week or so he was killed and uh, over in the Philippines this is after the Spanish American War and, uh, and so I, I really like that that it, uh, he, write, he wrote such a touching letter and it got into the newspaper. This may be the only opportunity that a family would have to get a letter and a document like this and a tie back uh, to that ancestor or that relative. Well, in addition to the personal items that are events and milestones in a person's life, there was the milestone of people coming over, passenger lists. In newspapers, these took on many forms. These are not just passenger lists of people coming from Europe to America. These are people that were passengers on any mode of transportation. I found stagecoach lists that would tell people migrating across the country. There are lists of people who got on the boat in, say, Philadelphia, but then got off the boat in uh, the Gulf of Mexico and in other states in the south. And so you're getting a record, a snapshot of internal migration. Now look, for example, at this article uh, talking about people who arrived in Duluth, Minnesota, 220 people. Here's the details on every one of them, a list of the passengers and where they were from. So if you're having tracking a family that moved across the country, you know, you, we sometimes have found it easy to track the person coming to the country from Sweden or Germany or France or whatever. But here's the opportunity to trace them within the country country as they moved. Big news, you wanted to know in Duluth, hey, we've got 220 more people living here, that's more jobs, that's more people to help out with the companies, that's friends and neighbors, that's a new uh, you know, person who's looking for a wife to get married to or uh, a husband or the like. This was, they'd go down and meet them at the dock, you know, to see, uh, see who might be appropriate for them. And uh, as it says, a large crowd of people were at the dock to welcome the vessel and the passengers. Big news. Here's an early passenger list that appeared in 1816 in an Irish newspaper called the Shamrock. I like it because it also points out where in Ireland the Irish passengers came from. So they had a ship that left. It, it docks in New London, Connecticut. And they switch to a different ship, but it talks about exactly where in Ireland, or uh, I think these are all Irish cities, might be that's an English one, but where they came from in the old country. Critical. You're just not going to find that in other records here in the States. Quickly moving through some other topics here as we wrap up the hour. Uh, you are also going to find detailed biographies, photos in the newspapers. In this case, an article, a lengthy article about the first homesteader, which uh, tells he was born in 1826 in Lewisburg, Preble County, Ohio, the son of Samuel and Phoebe Freeman, that he moved from Ohio to Illinois. It tells how he came to be the first homesteader under the Homestead Act, which was basically that he was still serving, and he was there, he wanted to get land, and the county recorder allowed him to take the oath at midnight, register his land, and then head out per his orders to get to St. Louis in time. The article also goes on to say he literally married the girl next door, Agnes Souter, and gives details about them and that they lived in Brownsville. Now, if you keep reading in the newspaper, a different newspaper, this is a Kansas City paper, the Kansas City Star, there's a picture of their house. So you just don't know what you're going to find in the newspaper. 
uh, whether it's an actual rendering of the person, picture of their home, the articles could have appeared in newspapers far away from where the persons lived. I was stunned to find an actual photograph of a runaway horse of my ancestor from the 1700s. This was a, ch a horse that had run away uh, or was stolen, you couldn't be too careful, uh, in 1799. But to get an actual picture, I was thrilled. Well, of course, that's not the picture of the horse, but he describes the horse in such detail. Uh, black mare, uh, white face, two uh, white hind feet, uh, how old he was, etc. You could almost come up with a picture and say that's probably what the horse looked like. So, I mean, it's a stunning thing when the newspapers just can just leap right out of the page with you and you get the image conjured up in your mind. Uh, but terrific to find these articles. Who knew that he had a horse that was missing? Who knew that he would take it to the lengths of publishing this in 1799? Couldn't have been a huge population in Freeport, Maine at that point. But there were other notices that had to be filed for legal purposes beyond, hey, my horse is missing. And uh, these types of legal briefs we find all the time. Probate is a typical one. Again, this is done for business purposes and to alert the heirs, so-and-so has passed away, we're going to distribute his worldly goods. And in this case, it would happen in Cheshire County, New Hampshire, who the administrators, who has passed away, oh, where did he pass away? Uh, details of the estate mentions the widow. So we're starting to get some of the clues, the boundary lines of the property, 100 acres, who would take action in this for behalf of the estate, and that all the heirs were told to appear on the third Friday of March next. Again, we quickly refer to a perpetual calendar, find out those dates. We could start to plot out and see how all of this applies see if we find references to our ancestors, cousins, and how we can fit the family together. Other legal notices that might appear is that someone changed their name. Now we hear people changing their names all the time, but this is an unusual one that he had to change his name to conform to a probate request back in the old country, back in England, a country of which he is a subject, so if he would change his name, uh, in this case to William Walton Lake, instead of Thomas Roby, he would get the inheritance. So I gather he changed his name and then got on a ship and went back to England and lived a rich old life. But uh, who knew? Who knew? Uh, you find changes of names all the time in newspapers. You may or may not know the conclusion. We think of it when a woman, for example, divorces her husband maybe for all kinds of dreadful reasons, the court still has to change her name to allow her to uh, totally make the break uh, from the former spouse. And people change their name because they simply want to and they place that in the paper. There are other legal notices. Hey, I will no longer be responsible for the debts of my wife, uh, Ida Powell, as of this date, uh, signed C.D. Powell, published in the Idaho Statesman of 1915. So these are, again, very strong clues. If he's not going to be responsible for her debts, chances are they're getting divorced or some such. And so these are all clues along the way to look for more information. In addition to legal briefs, there are what we call social briefs or social notes. And uh, talk of the town, gossip, uh, can be phrased many different ways. These can be really pivotal in finding details about a family. And so you get everything from the concerts and events to, uh, you know, Shirley's daughter is doing so well down in New York City. Uh, they've been there now three years since they got married. They just had a bouncing baby boy. She just got a new job, whatever the details might be. So we get to f travel with the family and uh, connect to them in other locations. Newspapers also have the news just as our ancestors actually lived it. So in addition to the details of them, we get the details of the day. Whether it was the battle at Lexington and Concord, the attack on Fort McHenry, and the, the writing of the Star Spangled Banner, uh, we're going to get the news. We're going to get the news as they lived it. I want to give you some quick rapid fire tips about using Genealogy Bank. Again, my basic tip is search on the last name. 
Start with a surname, see how much you get, see if it's appropriate, narrow it down by time span, narrow it down by place, then add in a first name, then add in uh, other information. But remember, you might have called the person Jonathan, but the newspaper might have put in JNO. So you, you have to search on what the newspaper used in order to get your person. Uh, if you are looking for the title list, notice that there is a title list attached to every bucket and you can click on it and see exactly what's in Newsbank, uh, arranged by uh, location, by title. And uh, when you zero in on the newspapers, you get to see the time span and, and it's by stage. You can click on this upper part and you can click through to whichever state suits you. Again, to reiterate what I said to you earlier, be sure in the historical newspapers when you pull up the search hits that you narrow your search if you have too many hits. Get a smaller group of search results so that you can quickly search through them. Uh, in addition to obituary and, and marriage, uh, well, I'm going to speed along here in interest. If you have difficulty reading it, you say, oh my golly, that's just too small. Notice if you click on the PDF button right here, it will instantly bring up a larger version or you can click inside the PDF version and it allows you to notice what we're doing here to just chunk out one little chunk but you can see how you can use this device here to just pull out a small section of the newspaper down below and you can zero in on just the marriage records. Frankly, I find the easiest tool to use once you've pulled it up in Adobe is just use Picasa, free software from Google, Google and you can quickly uh, cut, paste, and chunk out any part of a newspaper that you want. When you get your search hits, another easy tip for you is use the drop-down menu here. It defaults to the best searches at, for your search terms, but you can also pull up the oldest one or the newest one it might be another quick way to search through your paper. And the last tip I would give you is, can you read this? And at first glance, you may not think you can, but then you quickly realize, I couldn't believe that I could actually uh, understand what I was reading, even though this is that. And the reason is the, the eye naturally falls to framing a word in context based on the first and last letter. And uh, and that's how we do it, and we can read through it. And that's how your ancestors read through the newspaper. So when a newspaper publisher was trying to set the print, set the type for the day, this is before they had a linotype machine and the automated uh, machinery they have today, they would then have to put in letting. They would use other letters. They would substitute the number one for an L. They would substitute a two to W and an M, a D and a P, and, and all kinds of things that uh, would get them through that day's newspaper. They would put the type back in the proper spots in the box and pull it the next day's paper. So uh, the eye compensated for it. It's very difficult for a computer eye to compensate for these things. And one of the particular gremlins is letting, where they would add extra space so that a sentence would appear full on the page when it was published in a newspaper. And to the computer, it no longer sees those as whole words, but as individual words. That can wreak havoc with OCR in trying to pull back properly the name of your person. So you want to use a lot of flexibility, a lot of patience as you go through the newspapers. Bottom line never had this level of access before. As genealogists, uh, up until the late 70s, beginning of the 80s, pushing into the 90s, we never had access to the census like we did today. We all borrowed them on microfilm and considered that, you know, just a, something that we had to do to dig through it. Newspapers, people didn't try to budge because they were just too difficult. They weren't filmed generally or or loanable to, to libraries. But now that we have them on newspapers, on, uh, online, searchable, it's just an incredible day. So we need to dig through the newspapers like we just literally never were able to do before. And, uh, and they're going to help us document every day of our lives.
it's an amazing story and we need to dig into it. We want to encourage you to take full advantage of Genealogy Bank. We've got a special offer uh, that's available to you, to your friends, to anybody uh, within the sound of our voice, so to speak. You sign up, click here, easy to remember, genealogybank.com slash legacy, and then you'll get the best deal available right now so that you can have at Genealogy Bank for a whole year as much as you want. I would remind you that it just grew exponentially this morning or this month with the addition of over 150, 560 million records. So it's now over 1 billion records. So if you haven't searched Genealogy Bank in a while, you need to dig in and try it again. Jeff, I will turn the time over to you and encourage all the questions that people have that we can get, get you comfortable in using Genealogy Bank. Hey, thanks, Tom. Thanks so much. Uh, a, a wonderful reminder that newspapers are not just for obituaries. I think, uh, personally, I guess that's, you know, I, I tend to go to the newspapers to find that, but you've really provided uh, inspiration uh, and reminders to uh, search for everything else. Now, Tom, uh, there's one common question, and I, I want to uh, ask you this one before we get into some of our door prizes and the rest of the questions. But uh, here on my screen, I've got uh, genealogybank.com pulled up, and uh, you you mentioned it uh, briefly, but I, I just want to uh, demonstrate um, the answer to this. Lots of people have been asking about how do I find out what specific newspapers you do have on Genealogy Bank. And uh, so, Tom, you as you mentioned, you could just start out here at the beginning and just uh, start, you know, really broadly. Or, now, interrupt me, Tom, if I'm wrong or if you've got something better to say here about this. Right here, the historical newspapers is uh, is one of your, looks like one of your five main collections here. If you click on this link, is this right, Tom? If you click on View Title List, that will take you into the list where you can see every single uh, title that and and the date range that you have uh, covered. Is, is there anything That's else exactly you might say? Right. That's exactly right. We are going to make it, actually, it's not yet in place, that when you click on this, you can actually then clink, click from each one of these titles oh, and, good. Go right, and go right to a landing page. But right now, if you go back a step there, uh, Jeff, yep. click on historical newspapers. Okay. You'll notice that a map comes up in the lists of the states. If you have a favorite city, a favorite area, and so pick um, Minnesota, Oregon. Okay, pick Minnesota, and then say you want to search uh, St. Paul. It shows you what cities we have represented, and you click St. Paul. Uh, bingo! There comes up the list of the newspapers. We know we have them from 1849 to 1923. It says at the top. So at this point, you could search from this landing page, which is very easy to bookmark. You could just bookmark this page and say, "I want to refer to this often," and that will allow you to search only St. Paul, Minnesota newspapers. But a giant red flag should go off because of the examples I showed you in this uh, presentation. It is very common for newspapers elsewhere in Minnesota or neighboring states to cover births, marriages, and deaths in the surrounding area. And so you want to be careful when you limit it. But if, for example, you did want to, you could limit it. Or you could slip, click on the St. Paul Daily Pioneer, the Daily Press, and uh, whichever title, and search only that newspaper. And uh, so you have those options. Again, you can bookmark it at any step. You can bookmark this specific newspaper, all St. Paul newspapers, or all Minnesota newspapers. Whatever you think might be your uh, a bookmark that you want to refer to often, it will save you having to click down the steps. You can do the same exact thing for the recent obituaries. And so if you clicked on that bucket, um, it will show you a map. And, and the list, rather, the states. You click on a state, it will take you to the cities. And uh, so you, okay, click on Oregon. You click on the cities and say, oh, I just want to search Eugene or Portland or whatever. And this, again, is just for the recent obituaries, in this case, the Oregonian, published in Portland. And you can search the obituaries from 1988 to the present. And if that's something you know you're going to do often, bookmark it. And then you can click quickly go to just that page and uh, 
perhaps you're interested in only one or two or three states, you could bookmark those three state sites and just quickly go back and refer to them. It's just a handy device that we're using to make it easier to save people time. Great. Thanks so much. And uh, this has answered uh, lots of people's questions as well. Um, back to, let's go back to your home page. Let's, so I'll click on home. Can you mention uh, anything briefly, Tom, about the, the other uh, major collections you have here? For example, the SSDI here. Um, one of the questions is, how often is this updated? We actually update it uh, every single week and as often uh, as we can, even sometimes more often than that. But basically, it's every week it's worked on and updated. For the longest time, we were the only site that updated every week. I believe there's now one or two other sites that do update at least weekly. And again, you're, if you know a person was there and you're not finding him, use a few, uh, expand your search a little bit. Do not put in everything you know about a person. Uh, for example, you would not put in the first name and the middle name because you don't know that the Social Security Administration used those names. And so you want to search on what the person used. Sometimes the uh, Social Security Administration only put in the person's initials. So if you search on a full name, you're not going to find them. Sometimes if you say, well, I'm sure he died in 1967 or whatever, you might be wrong. Maybe it was actually 68. And uh, so what you could do is limit it. I don't know if you can see my cursor moving on the screen right now. Uh, but you not could yet. limit it by okay. But you could limit it if you look down halfway down your page. You can see that you could limit it by state or some other feature. Oh yes. So the general general rule of thumb is just to start out broad, and then when you need to, just start to narrow it down even further. That's what I would do. Okay. Well, wonderful. Uh, you can really spend a lot of a lot of time here on Genealogy Bank uh, exploring, and um, I'm anxious to get back to it. Uh, I'm, my uh, enthusiasm is once again uh, renewed for newspaper researches, and thanks for the reminders. But let's uh, switch back over to our what's left, um, and I want to do this as quickly as I can so we can get to the questions that have come in. We're going to announce our next webinars, give away some door prizes, discount codes, and then get into the Q&A. Uh, as, as I mentioned in the chat area, of your webinar control panels out there. Um, today's webinar will be in the archives, and uh, we'll put it up there uh, later on today, hopefully in just a few hours. Thanks again for uh, Tom and Genealogy Bank for allowing this to happen at no cost for our viewers. Uh, our upcoming webinars, well, we, we've already met today's here. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to read every single one of these because they are listed uh, down here on our website at LegacyFamilyTree.com slash webinars.asp. However, uh, just a quick reminder for uh, our next one, Best Internet Resources for African American Genealogy happening on August 31st, and then the next one uh, with myself on uh, September 7th. Uh, the fourth installment of our Watch Jeff Live series. This time we'll focus on adding a census record into Legacy. So uh, at any time, please uh, feel free to sign up for any of these upcoming webinars. And then uh, a couple of days in advance and, and even the same day of, we will uh, send you an email reminder with the link to join. So uh, uh, let's get into our door prizes. And uh, Tom, I appreciate you uh, talking about the, the, the link and the special offer. Uh, that you gave to us. Um, Genealogy Bank has graciously offered uh, two OneYearGenealogyBank.com subscriptions. Uh, there's their normal price on the screen, the sale for our webinar viewers, 20% uh, off through August 31st. And uh, there's the website there that you'd need to visit um, to take advantage of this spe special offer. Okay, so let me go over to my control panel and find who our first winner is. Our first winner is uh, congratulations to Janet Taylor. So congratulations to you. I'm glad that you were here today. Now if, uh, for our two winners here today, just watch your email for uh, correspondence and communication from Genealogy Bank. They'll get you all set up. So first of all, congratulations to Janet. And our second winner today, congratulations to Kevin Patton. So congratulations to you, both winners of uh, one year, genealogybank.com subscriptions.
And you know what? As uh, as Tom was uh, speaking, I I thought about uh, a recent webinar that we did on Watch Jeff Live adding an obituary. So I really quickly behind the scenes I added this into our door prize uh, listing here. So this is the recording of one of our. Um, uh, webinars, one hour, 51 minutes, shows you how to enter a printed obituary and an online obituary uh, from genealogybank.com. Now, it's you don't need one hour and 50, 51 minutes to learn how to do this, but uh, for those of you that have uh, attended the live sessions uh, previously, you know that we, we cover lots of different genealogy principles, methodologies, and so on. So uh, each of these webinar CDs are... Um, 9.95 in our store with the the coupon today. It's uh, even discounted further. And let's go see who our winner for this. Tamara Williams. So if uh, Tamara, you're still out there, congratulations. Uh, we'll get this sent right off to you. And finally, yesterday, or uh, it seems like yesterday, but a couple of days ago, we had a great webinar on Google Plus, the next big thing, with presenters Paul Allen, Dan Lynch, and Mark Olson. Um, they talked all about the uh, what you can do with Google+, Plus, its implications for genealogists, as well as a nice uh, ending here with the Google Hangouts. Mark demonstrated that really nicely. And so that webinar CD is also now available from our online store. And uh, we'll give away one copy of this. Well, let's give that to Janet Taylor. Oh, Janet, sorry, you you won the first one. We're going to have to... Your name came up. <laughs> We're going to go to give someone else a, another chance here. Let's go to Carol Will, uh, Watkins. Carol Watkins. So congratulations to you. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for participating. And now a gift for everybody uh, within the sound of my voice here. Uh, the 10% off coupon, good for anything in our online store. Uh, legacy software, training CDs, webinar CDs. Uh, lots of other things, even DNA kits uh, we've recently added. So this is valid through next Monday, August 22nd, 2011, and there's the code right there to use at checkout, just news. So once you type in that code at checkout, make sure you click on the Apply button, and that will be good for 10% uh, off of as much as you could fit into your online uh, cart. So very good. So uh, let's let's head on into the uh, Q&A session. Um, Tom, we've got some great questions and a lot of really nice comments here too. Uh, Michelle's saying this was a great webinar. Um, Sherry's saying this was one of the most informative she's ever attended, so uh, way to go, Tom. Um, really enjoyed it as well. So are you ready, Tom, for some questions? Yes, let's go. Okay, very good. Uh, Pamela. Okay, I'll just go right down these as quickly as we can. Pamela asks a question. She says, I know early vital records may be scarce. Is it more likely to find information in newspapers instead? And I think you did touch a lot on that, but the, you know, we didn't have birth certificates, you know, back in the 1700s, 18, early 1800s. So, uh, any additional comments you would say on, uh, on using newspapers for those early vital records? We may have lost you, Tom. Uh, let's. Oh, I see. Oh, here Sorry, we go. I had it on mute. <laughs> yes, the early vital records are terrific in the newspapers, particularly in contrast to what you find in the colonial state and county and town record, where it may only say child, and you know just refer to the name of the husband, for example. The nice thing about the newspaper article is it usually gives the child's name, tells the age, the date perhaps the name of the wife. They, not everything gets mentioned, I'll grant. Uh, but you usually get a lot more information, particularly, now this is uh, somber, but particularly if the child died, then you're going to get an obituary brief death notice, but you will get the detail. I, I have found so many times, hundreds and hundreds of cases as I've looked through this, where you'll get the exact date of a birth, the exact date of a death, the, the details on a marriage that are just unknowable uh, from other records because you, you don't know necessarily what town they went to when they got married and the like. So I found news, newspapers should be really, really rich uh, for somebody doing a, a colonial genealogy. Okay. So, uh, Great, thanks. Uh, let's go to a uh, question from Jackie and a question from Gay and then several others. They're asking about uh, ethnic papers. Um, 
do, can you comment anything about uh, newspapers for African American uh, ancestry or or uh, and then Jackie asked specifically about Polish language. Uh, another asked about German language. Do you, do you have any kind of collections like that up at Genealogy Bank? Uh, all of the above. We have the largest collection of African American newspapers uh, anywhere, period. And it's uh, over 260 titles, goes back to the early 1820s, and uh, it's absolutely a source you want to look at. Of course, in the examples I was giving, as in the case of Polish American newspapers or Spanish American or any other group as mentioned, uh, all of these individuals are also going to be documented in in the newspapers aimed at the general community. So while a, while a special focus newspaper like an African American newspaper, Polish American, Hispanic, uh, will be really good for finding extra details, you do want to look for your people in both. We do have Polish American newspapers. It's a growing area for us. We've just started to add a large collection of ethnic newspapers. So keep looking for those. And what was the third group that was mentioned? I heard it was uh, African American, uh, Polish. African, uh, Germany, I think. I German. Yes, we have quite a few German American newspapers these days back into the 1700s. The OCR was working very well. We've coordinated with the early German script that was used in those old newspapers. Uh, you're going to find a lot of detailed birth, marriage, and death records there. That's a great find for you. Great. And and specifically to find the ethnic collections, do you just browse uh, by location, or do you actually have them uh, categorized somehow on your website? Excellent question. We're adding that category for uh, all of the above. If you click, if you go to our home page at the very bottom, you'll see an icon for the African American newspapers. Click there. It'll take you to a page which lists them all. You can oh, right down the here. Titles. Yeah, Wonderful. you can select the titles that you want. You click the link, and it'll take you right to the landing page. We're going to do that for all of the other. Notice that you can then go in by state and the like. We're going to do that for all of the other groups that hasn't been completed yet as the collection is growing. We have over 360 Spanish language papers. I don't know how many German language, French language, etc., but quite a few. And right now you can search them by title from the general title list, but we are going to make uh, drop-down menus that allow you to search by language and say, let me search only German language newspapers or let me find the list of them. And so it'll be a quick way for you to do it. And uh, otherwise you have to spot them by title right now. But that, look for that to be an improvement we're going to be adding soon. Great. Uh, that is a wonderful improvement. Uh, tell everyone there, thanks. Uh, Sherwin has a question, Tom. And, uh, well, let me just read it and then uh, comment. He, he asks, when might the major newspapers from major cities be included, such as the New, New York Times or the D Detroit News? And uh, that question relates to several other questions about how does Genealogy Bank uh, determine uh, what newspapers to go after and add to your collections? Uh, it's our goal to get every newspaper that ever existed, but it's going to take time. And uh, your basic rule of thumb is if a newspaper, you mentioned the New York Times, they're still being published. So they they have great interest in who they permit to, uh, to reproduce, digitize, and put their newspapers online. We have no, we work with these publishers. We try to coordinate with them. We try to reach agreements with them. But we do not want to, uh, it, let's say an agreement cannot be reached yet. We then don't just take the newspapers that are available and do it anyway. We want to work with them and be uh, good neighbors and all of the above. So we wait till an agreement is comfortable for them, and then we run with them. So in some cases, they decide to go with other providers. And uh, so you have to get those on other sites. The New York Times provides it themselves for example, and they put other content out there on the web for free. And uh, so it's a different story for every newspaper, but we do have heavy, heavy coverage for New York City, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Kansas City, a lot of the major cities, as well as hundreds, thousands of the smaller ones as well. Okay, and then, Tom, what's the best way for me to uh, convince you guys that I have a newspaper that's, uh, that really should be digitized starting today? The best way for you to do that is to write in and ask us. 
and uh, get a thousand of your closest friends to do the same. No, please don't do that. <laughs> but you write in and ask, just make a basic case. Here's the newspaper. Here's where it's available. Here's why I think it should be included. Um, and we get it. We know everybody writes it. We get yeah. dozens of letters every week saying, please do our paper. Yeah. We try to accommodate everybody possible, and it's just a question of time. Yeah. What happens when it, let's say we get a newspaper and we say, yeah, that's right. Boy, how did we forget that paper? Let's go after it. We then have to track down what newspapers survived, where is the best copy, do, does the publisher, if it's still being published, do they agree to let us do it? Will they provide us with some of the copies and allow us access? Uh, if it's no longer published, who owns it? There's a repository, a library, an archives, maybe a current newspaper bought the rights to a old newspaper, so we have to determine that. That can take up to a year. And once we get a determination that we, we have it, we're going to go with it, then we have to find and make sure we have the best copies. Sometimes even we have plants around the United States, so it's happening in multiple locations. Maybe we get the paper in and it's missing issues. It's uh, uh, damaged. Uh, maybe it's on microfilm and it wasn't microfilmed properly. All kinds of things can slow down the production and we say, well, wait a second, they're missing three weeks, or wait a second, uh, the newspapers were uh, filmed on an edge and the, and the column closest to the binding edge is, is warped, is curved. We have machines that can actually compensate for that, but we'll also look for a better copy to start with. Because when we do it, we want to do it right, do it once, and provide it to everybody. So it is a, it is a juggling uh, situation. I can also say from another perspective, we may sign an agreement with a publisher, and they may be the publisher of 87 newspapers, and they, are, and they may say to us, we want you to do this, and guess what, we want you to do all 87 papers, and that's part of the agreement, you have to drop everything and do our titles first. And so sometimes that pushes some titles higher up on the list. But you can tell by the pace, we, make, we, we do an incredible amount of work in a normal month, we'll add 20 million items, and as I said earlier in the show, uh, this month we'll add over 160 million. So it was an incredible month, especially in August, if you think about it. Wow, oh, that is incredible. Wonderful. Uh, question from Kevin. Kevin is uh, saying, what if you know the exact date of a person's death? but you're unsure what newspaper it would be listed in. And before you answer uh, a, a related question that I, I can't remember who asked this one, but uh, what if you just know the title of the newspaper article, but you're not sure what newspaper is it in? Is there any way to search by keyword, for example, instead of just by ancestor name? Yes, great questions. Let me take those in two parts. Okay. The first one is, I know the date they died. Well, let's say somebody died on the 28th of a month. Okay, you may know when he died, but when did the obituary or death notice appear? That day, the next day, the next week, or if it was a colonial newspaper, maybe two weeks later. And so you have to be, don't be precise. And I've seen people who will then do a search, let's just say for May uh, 1863, because they know he died May 28th. Well, the obituary may not have appeared till June. And so you want to be flexible, and so you may want to put down just 1863 in the surname to try, and then when the results come up, limit by obituary, to try and, and generate a smaller number of hits. Uh, um, the other thing I would suggest to you is they sometimes, I had one just yesterday where a person was looking for a person named Willard Cook. Well, my dad's name is Willard. I know how to spell Willard. But apparently the people doing the obituary, the Social Security Death Index, both of them did not know how to spell it. Now that may tell me that his spelling was unique, but he spelled it W-I-L-L-I-A-R-D. So if we put in the traditional spelling for Willard, we wouldn't have found our person. But since I knew it was probably there, I took out the first name, searched only in the surname, bingo, I found it. I limited by the state, and in this case I limited by by county, since Cook is a very common name, then I was able to generate the correct spelling and then find the target information. Now your second case, what if I have a newspaper clipping, I have no idea what newspaper it was published in. Uh, you'd be surprised if you could show that to a librarian, they'll recognize the typeface and the look of a newspaper and they'll tell you what paper. Really? Let's say you don't have, 
Yeah, that's the experience I always had as a librarian for <laughs> over 40 years. But what you want to do then is you have the paper, you have the words in the article. I would start searching on the words in the article, and I would pick the most obscure words in the article, which may not be the person's name, because maybe the person's name was Robert Smith, something very common. Uh, I would look for the weirdest word so that you could get as few hits as possible. And you start using a strategy to winnow it down. Maybe you say, I'm pretty sure it was published at least in the 1900s. You may not know when. I would limit it by that, say 1900-1950, just some range to give it a ballpark. And then whatever word, obscure word, might be in the text. And you're sort of using your detective skills to poke at it and to try and see what would generate uh, a match. And then, of course, you do get the sneak peek, that snippet, and you can see the uh, part of the article and see if this is a match. Play with it. See what happens. Yeah, I, I love yeah. that. And it, you can actually, you could do that, Tom, I think, it, from your home page. Do you go to advanced search and then put the keywords in there? Is that what you would recommend? Exactly right. Okay. Just like you're doing right now. I would also say if all else fails, scan it. Send it to us. Notice if you pull down the record there, uh, do you see, uh, look at the bottom of the screen there, uh, Jeff. Oh. Go way down to the bottom. Oh, way down. Pull okay. Down. Yeah. See where it says Ask the Genealogist? Uh, as a member uh, of Genealogy Bank, you're welcome to click that button and ask us any question. Hey, I'm wow. stuck. I'm not figuring out what to do. Help. And uh, I try to monitor that. Uh, day and night, you'd be amazed. People get responses at two o'clock in the morning. Just depends where in the country I am and if I'm online. And if we can get you some help, we'll get it to you. We just want to make sure you're. And I will give you answers uh, searching other people's databases. It doesn't have to be just Genealogy Bank, but of course we will dazzle you with the responses you'll find in the <laughs> newspapers first. But uh, be prepared that we're we're there just to help you get your genealogy done and make this a, a, a great experience for everybody. Boy, what a wonderful service you provide there. So for all of you viewers, uh, just scroll down to the very bottom and click on the Ask the Genealogist uh, button right there. Uh, wonderful. You, you've you dazzled me just with that information there. That's great. Uh, we've just got time for another question or two, Tom. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that Lynette has uh, sent in. Lynette says, when looking for an obituary, a newspaper has the copyright information. Although I pay for genealogybank.com, will I be able to use that obituary in a family book? Uh, yes and no. We have a copyright person who, if you write in and ask that question for a specific newspaper, we can give you an accurate answer. But as a general rule of thumb, if you are producing an item for the family and you hand out copies to the 12 members of your family. I know you'll print 500 and they'll sit in your closet waiting for the other <laughs> eager members of the family. But generally speaking, a person creates a genealogy, they put the obituary in as an example, and then they share it with their grandparents and friends and cousins. That's totally appropriate. If you were publishing a book on all the obituaries that ever existed from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I'm publishing it as a book, and I'm selling it that's not appropriate because then you violate the copyright of the Philadelphia Inquirer and Genealogy Bank in providing it. So you need to just ask the question. And the other question that goes right along with it is, can I put that in my family history software? The answer is, of course, yes. These are there okay. for your personal use, but it's when you go to distribute it for others. If you say, I just want to put it on my blog and share it with the whole world, that's not appropriate. And uh, so you get a rule of thumb as something just for personal, internal type family use, terrific. Anything that's going to be wider than that small circle of 20, 30 people uh, is too broad. Again, we have people who can answer that question for you. Tell us what the obituary is. Just write in and say, here are the types of obituaries I'm doing. They'll give you the best information for that newspaper. Some newspapers exert more uh, restrictions than others. And so we want to, we have over 5,500 newspapers, and so we we'll want to give you the best appropriate guidance uh, for your circumstance. Oh, good. Wonderful. Well, let's uh, 
just a reminder, Mitch is asking the question, how do we subscribe and get the, the legacy discount? That's uh, just go over to genealogybank.com forward slash legacy. And again, that offer is good through the end of August of this year. I think it's for 20% uh, off. So Tom, a wonderful webinar. We're getting all kinds of wonderful comments coming in here. Uh, Mary Ann is saying, ask the genealogist, what a value for only $55 a year with today's discount. Uh, truly a hidden gem. Uh, before we leave, Tom, do you have any uh, last words of wisdom for us all? I do, and it's just a basic out uh, counsel. Keep in mind, it's an absolutely terrific day for genealogy. You can find your people. You can get the answer. Do take advantage of the Ask the Genealogist feature. But keep digging in those newspapers. It's just a treasure like we've never had before. And all the other resources going online, now's the day. And let's get it done. Great. Thanks, Tom. And uh, life is too short, so do genealogy first. Okay, so wherever <laughs> and whenever you are throughout the world, thanks for making today's webinar part of your day. Goodbye.